Ram is Paul McCartney's second solo album. His first album, McCartney, was mainly comprised of home recordings and experimental ideas and was very much a tentative step into the post-Beatles world and deliberately the antithesis of a polished Beatles production. The critics really weren't kind to him because of this. So for his second album, he wanted a more professional approach using proper studios and recruiting great musicians to play with instead of the do-it-yourself way he recorded McCartney. With the title Ram representing Ramin, meaning to push forward strongly, he was now finding his feet during a very difficult divorce from the Beatles. A lot of the songs for Ram were written on Paul and Linda's farm in Scotland. This remote hideaway was a perfect retreat from the intensity of the Beatles split and allowed Paul the peace needed to clear his head and begin to write music in a more carefree way. Songs like Ram On, Heart of the Country and Monkberry Moon Delight are good examples of this, with some of the songs written with Linda as they sang together. Initially without too much thought of forming a band, but Paul was so into the idea that he asked Linda to join him, and she agreed, but not without some nervousness, as she didn't have any background in music at that point. Needing a drummer and guitarist, they decided to head over to New York to see who was available. Amongst others, drummer Denny Sywell was contacted, but not given any information on who the gig was for. The only instructions were for what time and where to show up. The place was a not so salubrious warehouse basement with a hired drum kit ready for their new potential band member to display their skills on. When Denny arrived, he actually thought it might be a setup and was about to be robbed, so to see Paul and Linda there was quite a shock. Denny had worked with a lot of top names over the years as a session drummer, but not a Beatle, so he was keen to impress and also surprised that there were no other instruments present and that he'd be judged playing solo. Undeterred, he said to Paul, well I guess if you can't get on with yourself, then you can't get it on with somebody else. Denny believes this quick-witted response endeared him to Paul immediately and his drumming ability merely sealed the deal. Just days before being offered the job, in an amazing coincidence, Denny's friend called to ask if he was interested in buying Ringo's drum kit from the Shea Stadium gig that was up for auction locally. His first reaction was that there would be no way he could afford such a treasured item, but his friend wanted the snare for himself and the rest of the kit would be up for sale if he had the winning bid. After successfully winning the auction, he called up the next day to say the bass drum and two toms were his for $300 if he wanted them. Of course he bought them, and of course, he turned up on day one of the Ram sessions with this kit. Paul recognised Ringo's old kit, not before giving it a good double take of sheer surprise though. They employed a similar method in their hunt for a guitarist, setting up fake session musician engagements like a jingle session in an attic on 45th Street. This is where they recruited David Spinoza, although it wasn't long before he had to leave the session and was eventually replaced by Hugh McCracken. Hugh was actually invited to the original audition, but was in Florida at the time, working on an Aretha Franklin record. Engineer Dixon Van Winkle remembers Hugh. Everybody wanted Hugh on their sessions. He wasn't the best reader in town, but the parts he came up with were fantastic. I've heard lots of great guitar players over the years, and I'd say Hugh was in the top five. The recording got underway at Columbia Studio B on October the 12th, 1970. The studio featured a large live room and a custom console with plenty of Pultec EQs and Yuri 1176 compressors. It was recorded onto an Ampex MM1000 16-track recorder. The band were tightly grouped in the room, with no real concern over bleed between the amps and instruments. They were able to get all the basic tracks recorded at Columbia before taking a break for Christmas. And after Paul and Linda returned from Scotland in the new year, they reconvened at A&R Studios, also in New York. This studio was centered around the Neve 8068 console, and this is where a lot of the overdubs took place, including vocals, both lead and harmonies from Paul and Linda. The orchestral parts for Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey, and Backseat of My Car were recorded at A&R Studios also. Paul can be seen singing into the Electra Voice RE20 dynamic mic during the tracking stage, but I think a lot of these vocals would have been a guide and replaced with overdubs later using the Neumann U87 and the Neumann M49. Paul was on his six-string guitar, usually his Gibson Firebird or Epiphone Casino for electric, and his Martin D28 for acoustic, but never the bass. Since from around the Sgt Pepper days, Paul preferred to add his bass at the very last minute, a practice that is definitely quite strange, and must have been very odd for the other musicians. Denny Sywell remembers hearing it for the first time when he received the finished record. When he did get round to playing the bass, it was his Rickenbacker 4001S, and he appears to be using Fender amps, most likely the basement. Denny's old Beatles drums were recorded with U47s for overheads and the AKG D19 on the snare, which is very Beatles also. Kick drum and tom mics may have been the Electra Voice RE20 according to those in the know. Assistant engineer Tim Geelan remembers the sessions. Paul was a great producer. Thorough, business-like, but loose at sometimes. They were very comfortable sessions that followed the pattern. 
We'd start working around 9 or 10 in the morning. Then after rehearsing for several hours, we'd cut a version of the tune and then have a lunch break. After lunch, we'd listen to what we had and then record another couple of takes if it was necessary. After this, they headed over to Sunset Sound Recorders in LA for further overdubs and mixing. The mixing duties were undertaken by Eric Wamberg, or Eric the Norwegian as he was credited. Although Dan is a mixing engineer, he did play a key part in some of the production aspects during the overdub stage. A good example of this is when he recorded Paul's vocals for the track Three Legs. Along with his headphones, he also gave Paul two speakers to listen to the track through and get more of a feel of the song. Of course, this then created some leakage of the backing track onto the vocal, but instead of fighting it, he used it as an effect, adding some delay to it and bringing it up in the mix. Denny Sywell had some fond memories of the recording. he just play as a song and we make a part that go with it, and as soon as it sounded right, we just started recording. Paul was also open to experimenting with new sounds. For too many people, Denny drummed on a telephone book, and on Heart of the Country, he made a drum set out of a plastic waste paper basket and a piece of sheet metal. I was stealing my ideas from Ringo and the McCartney album, he says, but what a great place to steal from. Just making up nice little sounds and doing stuff off the wall. The creative door was always wide open, which was what was so nice about it. He also took note of Paul's unusual approach to his main instrument. He used to tune his bass out of tune. He used to tune the A string a little flat, which gives him this distinct sound that he always had. It plays in tune, but it gives it another quality that no other bass player on the planet could get. He had his own way of doing things. I had a quick investigation into this bass tuning story by extracting the bass from Monkberry Moon Delight and Uncle Albert using AI separation on the Lal Lal website. Taking a piece that features an alternating fifth played on the E and A strings, looking at Melodyne, it actually looks like the notes are a bit sharp. Maybe his action was high and he fretted sharp, so the open string was tuned a bit flat for that reason. But it's really difficult to actually know whether the entire pitch of the track has changed slightly with transfers or even deliberately, so the jury's still out on that one. The album was released on the 17th of May 1971 on Apple Records, and disappointingly for Paul, to an unfavourable critical reception. Rolling Stone magazine called Ram incredibly inconsequential and monumentally irrelevant. In the NME, Alan Smith further called it an excursion into almost unrelieved tedium and the worst thing Paul McCartney has ever done. Paul was hurt by this, but the record buying public thankfully disagreed and the album reached number one in the UK and number two in the States, with the cover showing a photo of two Beatles effectively screwing each other. Many people, including John himself, were quick to realise that there were some messages in there the opening song, Too Many People, was definitely about John. It was a very thinly veiled comment on how many people like him were getting a bit preachy and effectively telling everyone else how to live their lives without sorting their own out first. This later prompted Lennon to write How Do You Sleep? McCartney never did get round to writing quite well actually, and eventually the public spat petered out as they became friends again. Three Legs was believed to be about the other Beatles too, but Paul denied it. Today, Ram is held up as an indie rock pop classic. Songs like Heart the Country and Uncle Albert Album of Halsey are up there with some of McCartney's best solo work in my opinion. And as an album, it works especially well as a collective and a great listen from start to finish. <laughs>